just let me out That clock keeps ticking like a metronome And my thoughts keep telling me to get me home But my balls keep telling me to let me out Oh, just let me out Let's be real with ourselves. The introduction of the Rolex Daytona was a flounder. It almost seems to be propaganda to say that nowadays, but the launch was a flop in more ways than one. Rolex wanted to be the first watch on the moon, and even to this day they proudly label their pieces with Cosmograph on their dials, like they have a claim to space. Sort of like the underachiever who, after quitting their job on the first day, still puts the experience on their resume. The question I'll leave, that I hope to answer by the end is, do people buy Daytonas today for their intended purpose, or for the image that is affiliated with them? How did the Daytona become so popular? That in itself is a fairy tale ending. It became attached to an icon of motorsport. We all know this man, and we all know the watch he wears. It was through media, a bit of marketing, and images that turned this watch into what we know today. The simple steel watch transformed into something worthy of the crown, and now it is considered to be higher than royalty. But this man, Paul Newman, was one of the most important names for the watch's success. Ever since the 80s, the Daytona has been more and more sought after, and now they are the holy grail for many enthusiasts and collectors. So if this watch wasn't so popular today, would we find it attractive or even appealing? That is an interesting question. I think it is fair to say that before the Daytona and the others arrived on the scene, Hoyer had the market where they wanted them. Some of their pieces from that time period looked phenomenal. And they had the right idea when it came to chronographs. The simple word called contrast. I'll begin with some of the Newman references and their successes. These models all have similar DNA. Small, sleek, understated. The design language at the time was for them to be worn first as a functional dress watch, but also as a watch that could be worn on the racetrack or anywhere else. There was no requirement for flash or bravado back in the day. These watches were not made to exude any kind of image. You could almost argue that Rolex was unsure of the watches and their personas back then because of how sparsely printed the dials were. Even then they had the right mind of less being more when it came to formatting a dial. Now forgetting the hype around them, Forgetting the brand and the image associated to them, I'm being honest when I say that these are phenomenal looking watches. From a design point of view, every one of these pieces has excellent visual aesthetics. It is clear when I say that these original pieces were designed with the intention of being a watch based on function first. And with anything well designed, it is functional, it is unobtrusive, it is honest, and most importantly, it is long lasting. Those foundations set by the original Newmans, coupled with a fair amount of hype and names affiliated to them, launched the Daytona into the modern era. But the design language changed somewhat when the watch entered the 80s. The case was now 40 millimeters instead of being 37 and 38 millimeters. The watch had large crown guards. The case was now an oyster case and assumed the form that we would be accustomed to seeing in the future. But interestingly, the dial is where, in my opinion, the language was lost. The smaller indices boasted on the original four-digit Daytonas were elongated and took up a much larger portion of the dial, which in turn shrunk the watch's subdials. I have a few problems with this approach, and why do I say that? Why are the subdials filled in with the older references, but not with the newer references? Simply put, it has to do with presence and visual weight. Where the older subdials were solid, making the markers a standout feature, also making the dials integral to the watch, the modern subdials are hollowed out to reduce weight and presence. This is a unique design approach, one could say an impressionist approach, but it does subtract details that make the watch a chronograph. Now, if we look at the watch from a distance on someone's wrist, You can see that the subdials, though still there, are pushed into the background. The design is unique, but is it necessary? Returning to my point on whether these watches are bought today for their function over their fashion, I would have to say that fashion takes precedent. Is that a bad thing? Absolutely not. Wearing watches like these allows us to walk in the footsteps of what made this piece so iconic. You are a part of the club when you own one. 
But it does sadden me that a watch like this, that had so much potential to be more than just an accessory, instead to being an actual tool like it was intended, has now lost that provenance. I would say that a very small percentage of people who buy these use them for their chronograph abilities. And now because of platforms like this, the hype around them has built to such extreme levels that you will be lucky to ever own one. But there is one watch that has never changed, and I think you all know what that watch is. Arguably the best watch that has ever been produced by the brand, having remained in production since 1957. Over the years this watch has seen incremental changes, but this model has survived through the decades and is loved by so many. Why has it survived? I would say that Omega understands the watch's original purpose, and has always built it around being a tool watch first and a fashion accessory second. Those who buy the watch know its heritage, they wear the watch proudly, and most of those who own the watch use it for its intended purpose. So what does the Speedmaster Professional prove? My answer is that change simply for the sake of change is not always necessary.